welcome to this month's EM Live. This month, we're going to go over the lemon law for the difficult airway, also known as making lemonade out of a lemon airway. So a failed airway, what's the definition? So uh, emergency department data estimates about 1% of patients have a failed airway. Uh, they typically define a failed airway as being unable to intubate a patient after three attempts by a skilled operator. Uh, I think that most of us don't consider actually that as the true definition of a failed airway. A failed airway is when we are sweating, we wish we uh, were not the one taking care of that patient and that we could actually be done with her shift and be at home right now rather than trying to deal with this falling apart situation. That I think is more the definition of an emergency physician's failed airway. Uh, I think as long as we can keep bagging, saturate the patient, we're not traumatizing the airway by our attempts and making it all swollen and harder to intubate, but we're taking it slow, we're keeping them oxygenated, we're going to our next step, which may be a bougie, it may be a fiber optic scope, um, maybe we're using the glide scope. Uh, I think that that's not really a failed airway in my mind. I don't think it's a failed airway in your mind. The failed airway is, oh my God, their sats are dropping. I can't bag them. Oh, they're, look, they're turning blue. Sats are 50. I'm making another attempt. That's a failed airway. But let's go through this lemon law, which hopefully will alert us to that fact that this may be a patient who could end up with a failed airway so we can uh, plan for disaster, if you can plan for disaster. So the, the mnemonic lemon, so that's look, evaluate, mal and potty, obstruction, and neck mobility. Lemon, look, evaluate, mal and potty. Sounds like, mal and potty is such a strange sounding word, isn't it? Uh, sounds like a, uh, what you call the uh, toilet facilities in some foreign country. But anyway, I'm sure it's uh, somebody's name and I just insulted some very important person. But anyway, mal and potty, obstruction, and neck mobility. No offense indicated. All right, so let's go over look. Uh, so it's always a good idea to look at the patient you're going to intubate. And I, I actually like that look is in there because a lot of times when things are going crazy, we sometimes don't take the time to actually stop and just look at the patient we're about to deal with. So we're looking, are they obese? Do they have a bunch of facial hair or facial trauma, gigantic uh, beard? Uh, do they have neck surgery, big scar over their throat? That's never a good sign. And one that got me recently, partial dentures. I was intubating a patient, all set to go. Now, he was already kind of clamped down, so I wouldn't have been able to get in there really well anyway. But uh, I should have thought about could there be partials or dentures in there. And as we're putting them down to intubate, I, I got him uh, paralyzed. I open his mouth, and up, oh, he's got partials in. And now they're loose, and they, of course, fall back into his airway. And now I'm fishing around and I'm pulling them out. Um, and everything turned out fine, but it reminded me that I need to think about these things in every patient I intubate. Partials are really easy to miss. And they're small, so they fall back in the airway. All right, so uh, don't forget the dentures and the partials. Evaluate is the E, the 3-3-2 three, three, rule. So three of the patient's fingers should fit into his open mouth. That lets you know that the mouth opens wide enough to get your scope in there and actually see what you're doing. Um, and remember, it's the patient's fingers, so if you have gorilla hands, that doesn't count. Then it's uh, three of the patient's fingers from the men mentum, so from the tip of his chin, back to the hyoid bone, or basically the side length of the chin here should be about three of the patient's fingers. And then two fingers from the top of the thyroid cartilage, you can feel your little notch there, to the floor of the mouth or floor of the mandible essentially or the hyoid bone. So it should be three, three, two. And that's a sign that they have good anatomy, they don't have a real small jaw or something that's going to be hard to intubate. Mall and potty, my favorite. All right, so there's three classes. I, these are always so confusing. Um, but here's a little diagram that basically goes over it. So with class one is the good, the one you want to be. Class one, A number one, that means everything's good. You can see their whole soft palate, hard palate, their full tonsils, and their full uvula. Class two, you can see part of the tonsils. 
uh, and you can still see the hard palate, soft palate, but now you may be missing just the tip of the uvula. Class three, well, tonsils are pretty much gone. You can see the soft and the hard palate. And class four, now you only have the hard palate. So obviously as you go up in class, it gets more and more difficult to intubate. So you want to look in the patient's mouth. Then obstruction. So do they have stridor? Is there a possibility of a foreign body? Is there, are you worried about epiglottitis? Is there something where you're worried that this could be a difficult airway simply due to something obstructing your ability to intubate? And finally, neck mobility. So obviously anybody with a suspected C-spine injury or, an, or where you're protecting their C-spine is considered to have neck immobility. You can't move their neck. You have to do inline stabilization which I like to do by having somebody stand instead of beside me, which was initially how I learned it. You know, there'd be a person standing beside me, holding the neck, kind of bent down on their knees, uh, holding the head. And I've moved to the, uh, I think, much better position of having a person who's standing in front of me, facing me, reaching over the patient's body, and holding their head from that side. And I think it leaves you much more mobility. Then are you worried about arthritis? Are you going to pith them because they got some rheumatoid arthritis and ligamentous laxity at the top of their cervical spine? Or are they severely kyphotic where their head doesn't even hit the pillow when they're lying there? We know those patients, they look like a, like a big letter C. And you think, oh gosh, how am I going to intubate that person? So neck mobility. So let's go over that one more time. So the lemon law. Look. Oh my gosh, I'm about to intubate this patient. I better look at them. Evaluate, that's the 3-3-2 three, three, rule. Mal and potty, one is good. Four is very bad. Obstruction, well, oh my word, that something's blocking this airway, epiglottitis, and neck mobility, the letter C. All right, I hope you enjoyed this month's EM Live. We will see you next month. Bye for now. <laughs>